in all of my undergraduate training, and especially in more interestingly, even in my graduate training, which I did uh, in applied clinical nutrition, I never once was introduced to the word leptin. And so it, you know, and it turns out leptin plays a key role in so many aspects of our body and how it functions and has an intimate connection with the hypothalamus, which as you remember, that's the receiver of the light signals. When light enters the eyes, it contacts, it gets uh, communicated to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that, that master circadian clock in our brain that is in the hypothalamus. And so now uh, when, we, when you think about how light and the circadian rhythm and the hypothalamus, how all of those intersect, and now we learn how leptin is also uh, has the ability to communicate with the hypothalamus, we start to see this beautiful interplay between our light environment and how that can influence things like metabolism. And so leptin, I'm going to talk a little bit about leptin, very, you know, brief here, right? There's, there's so much that we can say about this, but from a clinician's perspective, I think it's very important to understand that leptin is a blood marker that you can actually test to see how your client, if your client might be um, facing either a, a, what would be called leptin resistance or high leptin or low leptin. And specifically today, I'm going to talk about low leptin. So leptin is a hormone that's actually made in the fat cells and then secreted from the fat cells. It travels through the blood and then it gets to dock into the hypothalamus. And so its job is essentially to do a download about the amount of energy stores and our food intake essentially. So leptin is designed to get released from fat cells after we've digested a meal. So picture what happens when we eat. We eat food, that food breaks down, that food breaks down likely into glucose and free fatty acids and amino acids, right? And once that has all been processed by the cells and then some of it might've gotten stored away, uh, either as glycogen or in the fat, that is when leptin is designed to get released from the fat cells to essentially dock in the hypothalamus and give a download about our nutrient status, our fat status, our energy status on our bodies. And so leptin travels to the hypothalamus to dock in something called the leptin receptor. And based on the information that's being, based on how the, how that leptin receptor is being activated, we start, we can see uh, shifts and changes in things like hunger levels. So ideally, once we've eaten a meal, right, and leptin can dock to the hypothalamus, that should signal high levels of satiety. Uh, so that would, that would regulate food intake and it can regulate metabolism. It can regulate tissue repair. It can regulate hormones of fertility. I'm going to talk a lot about, uh, about that in the next slide here in this little mini presentation. Make note, high insulin levels will compete with the leptin receptor. So if we have someone who's dealing with insulin resistance, likely they've also got leptin resistance because leptin is being outcompeted for by insulin. And so there are strategies we use when someone is leptin resistant and insulin resistant. That's when both of those are elevated and other strategies that we use when leptin is low. Um, other things can actually have been, been suggested to impair leptin signaling as well, including inflammatory cytokines. So being in a state of elevated inflammation can impair leptin signaling. And it's even suggested that various toxins such as heavy metals uh, also have the ability to impair the leptin receptor. And so, you know, yes, clinically that can make for a more complex picture, but I do find the leptin blood levels and the leptin receptor uh, uh, is responsive to the things that we discuss when it comes to light signaling, exclusions on water, appropriate cold exposures, appropriate meals and meal timing, they're uh, blocking the artificial light at night. All, all of that can go a long way towards optimizing leptin levels and also insulin levels as well. So when, when we either, so there's a lot of ways that the signaling can get impaired, right? We can have low leptin, we can have high leptin, but if there's poor communication with that leptin not being able to dock, either way, that's going to actually equal a scarcity signal in the body. Um, so the body, when it doesn't know how much energy it has stored on it, it's going to assume that the energy levels are low, that it's in a, a period of scarcity. The great analogy for this is if your car did not have a, a correct fuel gauge, then you would likely stop at a gas station way more frequently to fuel back up than you normally would if you had actually had accurate fuel track, uh, actually an accurate fuel tracking mechanism. And so if we don't have an accurate fuel tracking mechanism, we are going to uh, have a body that has an increase in hunger signals, a body that might get cravings more frequently, and a body that's also not likely going to want to release fat from storage because it doesn't know um, 
it thinks it's in a period of scarcity. So it's going to downregulate a lot of metabolic function, such as thyroid hormone, in order to conserve energy because it's just not aware of its energy status. And so when the body is in the assumption of scarcity, which is a low energy state, it doesn't think it's going to have adequate energy for tissue repair. So if you're dealing with chronic inflammatory, a chronic inflammatory condition or, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, the body is not going to say, oh yeah, let me dedicate a ton of extra energy to uh, repair that because it doesn't think it has it. Similarly, the body is going to downregulate the hormones of fertility. And that's because having a baby, growing a baby takes a lot of energy. And so if leptin levels are low, if, if we have, especially if we have low leptin, those hormones are, are uh, the hormones of fertility are going to get downregulated as well. So this is when we see potentially this idea of an anovulatory cycle or not getting the appropriate surges of hormones when we need them in order to signal, um, in order to signal ovulation and, you know, um, the sustainability of a pregnancy. So that this is a big deal, right? Leptin is a big deal. And it's not just for the, the metabolism and the hormones to, to be able to be optimized. When we have accurate leptin signaling, when leptin can communicate our energy stores, that's also a nervous system support. Because if the if the body always assumes that we're in a period of scarcity, scarcity that plays a big time stressor on the nervous system as well. Um, and so this has a lot of cross sections. It's not just about tracking, you know, for let's say for fat loss, leptin levels are um, across the board very important when it comes to optimizing just human health in general. And so clinically, um, we definitely see leptin issues when we have both high leptin, which can also be called leptin resistance, and when leptin is low, which would be starvation, leptin starvation state, or leptin scarcity state. And what's interesting is that this is a blood marker that can be tested. I have clients test it. I have certain clients track it. Um, uh, depending, right? Not everyone has access to leptin. So for example, in Canada, it's a lot harder to get leptin tested. Um, there, there are workarounds there, but it can be more challenging. Uh, certain states also don't allow necessarily self-ordering blood work. And many physicians are unaware of the importance of tracking this biomarker. And I don't think blood biomarker tracking is the best way to assess what's going on in one's body. However, I have found leptin to be a very accurate marker to, to track when it comes to understanding how the how the body is perceiving its energy status. And so um, it's done on a fasted test, a fasted blood test. This is not going to be told, you're not going to be told if you get this uh, ordered, let's say you self-order it from request a test or something like that, or you have a client to do that. It's not going to say it needs to be fasted, but leptin levels fluctuate post-meal. So it absolutely has to be in a fasted state, ideally about a 12-ish hour fast, overnight fast in order to track accurate leptin levels. Um, and then based on whether leptin pulls high or low for an individual client dictates so many things involved, especially low. I think low leptin is a is a, an interesting one because people who are low leptin, um, you know, it's, it's easy to get caught up in a lot of the trends and the fads. I'm not gonna say these things are necessarily trends or fads, but they become trends or fads because they get pushed on social media over and over again. And so someone who is low leptin in a feel like their body's feeling like it's in a, a period of scarcity and low energy status, fasting would not be a great idea, right? Um, excessive ketosis would not be a great idea excessive cold plunging or even cold plunging in general might not be a great idea. And so that's why I like to dictate or dictate, delineate when my client, whether my client has low leptin or high leptin, because a client who has elevated leptin levels would very much benefit from more of a ketogenic approach, would very much benefit from appropriate intermittent fasting and cold plunging exposures. So we have strategies that we would optimize for high leptin and strategies we would try to maybe avoid for low leptin. And so leptin is a great biomarker. And if you're interested in learning more about leptin, about how we can, if someone has low leptin versus high leptin, the strategies that I lay out for those clients, some case studies as well, I've got a whole practitioner module dedicated to um, metabolism um, and really, really heavy, heavy in the information that I'm talking about regarding leptin.